All right, so we have our first panelist. Uh, this is to introduce Christina Marinacci Ware. Went to Foothill High School in Southern California and then went on to USC from 2009 to 13. Uh, Division I basketball player for USC. Now is a head coach for club basketball in Southern California and a specialist in customer experience for Hyperice. Uh, a lot of you have probably seen that company. If not, I'm sure Christina will talk about it a bit. But thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Or me. Excited to be here. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's okay. You're the one with the pre-recorded video. Everybody else will be there. So that works. Um, there so go. the purpose of the panel today is to talk to our middle school and high school athletes, which you have a ton of experience with, and those looking to get scholarships. So I guess I want to start with your story. Um, how old were you when you first realized that you could or that you kind of would pursue an athletic scholarship? So um, let's see, that's a great question. I was in uh, my freshman year when I started receiving questionnaires. So that's typically how colleges start to reach out to you is through these questionnaires to see um, if you're one interested in their school and in their program. And then it's also a way for them to get to know you better. So um, those questionnaires typically ask you like fun questions, like favorite food, favorite color, favorite athletes, like those kind of things. Um, so started receiving those my freshman year. I actually got my first one from USC. Um, and then, so I don't know if that was a sign or what, but, um, I actually committed super early. I committed, um, at the end of my sophomore year. Um, you know, which I was excited about the school looking back. Do I wish I would have maybe taken more visits as I got older probably, but it all worked out for the best. Um, but yeah, the, the whole, recruiting uh, processes a lot. So um, it's great, Liam, that you're putting this together. And so would love to talk about all that. Excellent. Let's dive in. Um, so were you, after you got those questionnaires, at that point, did you become proactive in reaching out to coaches and schools and making those contacts? Or was everything pretty much coming inward toward you? Um, definitely both. So as soon as I started getting questionnaires from schools that I was interested in, um, I, you know, I'd reach out, let them know I was interested and just continue those conversations and start building those relationships with those coaches. Um, just, you know, let them know a little bit about me, learn about the school, learn about their program, um, what girls they have that are already in my position that are there. What are they looking for? Um, and then, you know, just kind of going from there and seeing if it's a fit. Um, as soon as you start to realize, okay, this is a school where I have bonded with the coaches, I've bonded with the girls, then you just start, you know, letting them know, Hey, these are my game schedules, my club schedules. I would love to have you come out to some games. Um, I played before the whole YouTube and, um, like huddle era. So sending game film wasn't a big thing for us at the time, but, um, you know, just letting them know when you're when you're playing and just make yourself available as much as you can. So, yeah. And from who did you really seek advice uh, when you were going through the recruiting process? Um, did you have either of your parents who had maybe already been through this process themselves or knew of it or were they completely new to it as well? Yeah, my parents were completely new to it as well. I mean, my dad played in high school and a little bit in college, um, but the I mean, recruiting's a beast, so we were just learning as we went. But my high school coaches and my club coach were actually really big in, um, and very involved in the recruiting process for me. One, especially because my club coach had a lot of had a lot of relationships with these club coaches that I was talk or I'm sorry, these college coaches that I was talking to. So he was a good person to have in our back corner because, you know, he knew me, he knew the coaches, he was able to give input on whether it'd be a good fit, if the chemistry would be good, um, and just kind of advice going forward. Um, one of the biggest pieces of advice that he gave me, actually, which I love to give my girls is when you go on these trips to these schools, don't just talk to the superstar kids on the team. Go talk to the girls that have had injuries. Go talk to the girls that are walk-ons that might not get a lot of playing time because they're going to kind of tell you how it is, you know, at the very worst. Um, I definitely talk to girls that have had injuries just because it's okay. How are they handling their scholarships? Are they, you know, are they still honoring that? And are they still valuing them as a player, even though they might be going through, you know, a hard time? So, um, those are definitely important people to have those conversations with to get a realistic view of what it's going to be like when you get there. Because as you're being recruited, 
they tell you everything that you want to hear. It's, you're the greatest player ever. We need you. You're going to be such a great fit. But then once you get there, it can be a bit different, you know, and now you're coming in with other girls that they've told those same things to. And, you know, you just got to you got to make sure that you ask all the right questions to make sure you know what you're getting into. Planning for the unfortunate, you talk about injuries. What is your understanding now of is there a universal code amongst college you know, coaches and institutions about honoring scholarships if a career ending or at the very least season ending, ending uh, injury happens? Or is it each school makes up their own kind of policy regarding that? So, yeah, I mean, as far as I know, this is how it was when I was in college. But if you get injured, they have to honor your scholarship. It's not like, okay, you're, you know, you're a broken toy and they just toss you to the side and you lose your scholarship. Um, You know, they're supposed to provide whatever medical assistance that you need, whether it's surgery, God forbid, and, um, you know, help uh, help you get better and recover fully before they can just, Mm -hmm. you know, take your scholarship away. So I think the only way you can lose your scholarship is by becoming um, academically ineligible. Um, But as far as like medical, you know, injuries, I I think you're safe for for scholarships. Speaking of academics, then, um, how did you end up originally balancing? Let's go back to high school. You were a prep star in many ways. Uh, I believe you were Miss Basketball California. Is that right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Long uh, time so, ago. <laughs> uh, what year was that? Uh, oh, nine. Okay. So in your senior year, you were Miss Basketball California. Uh, and balancing that kind of hype and probably an intense private lesson schedule, uh, club schedule, high school schedule, and probably a lot of obligations. How did you balance that with your academics, um, with hopefully some social life as well. Hopefully you enjoyed your high school experience. Like how did you compartmentalize each part of this or how did you navigate? Yeah, it's a lot. Um, you know, I mean, when you're in high school, I had a goal of getting to that collegiate program, getting that scholarship. So yes, basketball was fun and, um, you know, this extracurricular activity, but at the same time for me, I looked at it as a job. So I missed a lot of high school dances. Um, My summers were dedicated to traveling for club basketball. I didn't get to go to the beach with my friends and the birthday parties and all those things. But at the end of the day, it's just the sacrifice that you have to make in order to get to that next level. And that's kind of what separates you from those other kids is, okay, are you willing to make those sacrifices and put in the time that those kids aren't willing to do? And then you eventually separate yourself and become better and then um, you know, catch the eyes of the college scouts and get those scholarships. So, um, you know, it, it wasn't easy. And I, I fought my parents a lot when it came to having to go to a club tournament or practice over some social things. But um, like I said, it's just it prepares you for life, because especially once you get to, to the college level, um, that's really when basketball is your job. That's why you're there. You're on scholarship. You have to earn your keep. So, you know, academics kind of become... I don't know, in the back seat, because with basketball, for example, we had three hours of practice and then we'd have an hour of weightlifting and then we'd have maybe 45 minutes of film. And then if you need to go get treatment, that's more time. And then by the end of the day, that's like five, six hours that you're dedicating to a sport. And then you have to run to your class, um, make sure you're on time, try to get something to eat if you can. And then, you know, try to stay awake while you're in class because you're so exhausted. But Um, you know, it starts in high school, like you said, and you just have to learn that time management and that dedication and those sacrifices. And it will carry with you for the rest of your life, whether it's college or when you get your job. And, you know, so it just teaches you at an early age to prioritize those things. Absolutely. And I know that we've spoken a bit before about the slightly different dynamics that maybe men have to look at when they're considering scholarship offers and schools and athletics versus what women have to consider. Um, Now, you refer to basketball or whatever sport you play as once you're in college, especially at a significant D1 program, um, go Trojans, uh, (laughs) to be your job. uh, And academics in some ways kind of take a back seat. But moving forward, was the end game for you? And do you think the end game for a lot of female athletes out there is to become a professional? Or is it to parlay whatever you can from your university into a career of your choice? And how did you kind of pursue that yourself? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Um, Like you mentioned, it's it's so different for girls than it is for guys. I mean, if you look at the NBA, I think there's like 24 teams with 15 or 16 roster spots on each team. But compared to that, you have the WNBA where there's like 10 or 11 teams 
with 12 roster spots on each team. So there's half, I mean, yeah, definitely less than half spots for the WNBA than there is for the NBA. So it's just, it's competitive. And then you look at these women and they stay in the WNBA until they're, you know, late thirties, early forties. And there's just, yeah, not a lot of room for newcomers. So with that being said, well, I'm not even talking about the difference in paychecks and lifestyle, but with that being said, you women really have to consider, okay, this is a school that I want to go to to play basketball and somewhere where I think I'm going to be sex- successful as an athlete, but also a school that's going to set me up for success after basketball is done because, you know, our careers typically end sooner than men's do. So for me, um, I knew that I wanted to study sports broadcasting and USC has an incredible um, communication school at Annenberg. So that was another big reason why I wanted to go to USC. Um, But, you know, and then once I got to USC, internships are now very important. But if you look at our summer schedule, which is the only time that we can really have internships because the regular year is so crazy with season and um, normal classes, Um, during the summer, our coaches didn't really want us to take time away from basketball for internships. So that was something I had to literally fight with my coach for is, Hey, I've been offered this internship. It's full time, but I promise I'm going to get my work in either early in the morning. I was going to the gym at like six in the morning to get my basketball workout done with my coach or having to come back after the internship and doing it afterwards. So um, you know, but okay. it's, it's something that's uh, really important I for women because then, you have um, to set yourself you... up for once you graduate because, you know, it's just, it's how it is, unfortunately. But I think schools and coaches are starting to realize that more and are, are starting to be a lot more helpful and, um, you know, willing to uh, have those players give up that time for internships, which is great. But yeah, we, we got to put the work in for sure. And one more question about you, if I could, before we turn real quick to any advice that you would have for the modern day athlete, um, you know, fast forward uh, about a decade or so since you went through this process, um, Mm -hmm. finding the right fit, what did you look for? And speaking of that in a school, what would you do differently if you were either an athlete today or you could go back and talk to 2007, you? (laughs) Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Looking back, like I mentioned, I I committed so early to USC, but that was also because I fell in love with the coaching staff. I fell in love with the girls on the team that were freshmen and sophomores, who so girls I was going to play with. Um, And I really did fall in love with the campus. Like as soon as I stepped foot, um, you know, of course, my first time on campus was for a football game. So there's so many people on campus and just feeling that those Trojan traditions and the music, like it was just like, okay, it pulled at my heartstrings like this is home. Um, but I mean, I do wish I would have maybe waited a little bit longer and taken all of my official visits, um, instead of just the unofficial ones and just really like making sure that I looked at everything. And then I, I really wanted to stay on the West coast cause I couldn't imagine leaving my family, but maybe just taking a couple visits to some East coast schools and just making sure like, okay, this for sure isn't where I want to go and just crossing that off the list. But, um, all right. Perfect. So, um, sorry for the interruption there, uh, but returning to what we were discussing with Christina, uh, especially you know how to pursue um, scholarship offers uh, if you're getting a little, if you're getting a lot of attention, um, how to probably advocate for yourself and make sure you give yourself the best chance to get either the most offers or the offers that you really hope to get from these schools to make college that much more affordable and or pursue your athletic and academic dreams. Um, all of these things get more complicated when we talk about COVID in the last eight and a half months. So um, what have you kind of seen with the girls that you coach, um, who I believe you said are freshmen, primarily in high school, uh, you coach the club basketball version of that. Um, what have you seen them do to try to adapt and you know, still get noticed and get exposure in the COVID world? What would you suggest to others who maybe have no idea? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I cannot imagine what you guys are going through right now. And I just feel for you. Just hang in there. Take it day by day. It's all going to work out. Just win the day. You know, don't worry too far into the future because nobody can control that. But for right now, all you can control um, is just trying to maintain those relationships with coaches. Um, So if you're already talking to a few coaches that you're interested in the schools, just keep in their ear. You don't need to bug them every single day, but just like maybe once a week, every two weeks, just check in. 
let them know what you're doing to stay in shape and continue, you know, getting better. Um, but if you're playing on a club team, I think that's really great because those, it seems like those are the only teams that are able to play right now since schools are shut down. So if you're on a club team, just try to get as much game film as you can. Um, don't send them highlight film or highlight clips. Everybody looks good on a highlight. Try to get, find some good games from the start to finish to send to them. Um, and just let them know like, Hey, this is when I'm playing. Would love to, for you to tune in or, um, I'm not super familiar with you know, if it's dead period right now or if they can go to games, but just still let them know when you're playing. Um, and then, you know, just do everything you can. So if you're going to go into the gym, like find a gym, find an outdoor court, go with your dad, go with your teammate, brother, whoever, and just go like for basketball, for example, five spots around the three point line, try to hit 80%. Like if you can hit 80% from the three point line, Coaches are going to want to see that. So get that film of you working out, send it to them, let them know that you're able to shoot and just little things like that to stay relevant, relevant and let them know like, Hey, I'm still determined. COVID's not going to get in my way. I want this. I'm working my butt off. Um, you know, and just, yeah, like I I can't say it enough. Just try to stay relevant any way you can get creative and just keep working hard, you know, control what you can control, put the time in every day. And, you know, even though it seems like it sometimes COVID's not going to last forever. So as soon as it's done and you're able to play again, make sure that you're ready and you're using this time to come back as a different player. So, um, you know, cause yeah, there's no excuse for you not being able to go to an outdoor court and get shots up or go on a run and stay in shape or lift or those kind of things. So just keep working at it. That's advice we could probably all take, even not the high school athletes here. Yeah, um, I know. I got to remind <laughs> myself every day. <laughs> well, you're busy enough balancing two things. So it seems that you've had the best training possible when you had basically a full-time job in an athletic career in college and a full-time job in the academic world in college. And now you're basically working full uh, two full-time jobs. Um, so that's par for the course for you. And I would suggest probably that it would have been harder without that prior training. So there are benefits to being over scheduled and overburdened and over busy with a lot of these things. Um, I guess there's not a ton else that I think um, jumps to mind right now. Is there actually, you know what, one more question. If you have a student who is really wanting to pursue some form of an athletic scholarship, maybe not a full ride or a 50% scholarship, maybe just something or a walk-on spot and hasn't been noticed by really any coaches or maybe just got their first letter of interest or email of interest. Is your advice any different for that, say, not academic All-American or McDonald's All-American or Miss or Mr. Basketball of a certain state? Is your advice any different or is it still the same? Um, I mean, no, it's just honestly, the, what you the amount of work that you put in is the results that you're going to get. So whether you're working your butt off in the classroom or on the court or both, like you're going to set yourself up for success. So, um, you know, just don't settle for anything less than great. I mean, that's just really what it comes down to, whether it's as simple as a test or a practice or things that you might not think matters just win those little things because as long as you win those small things those small things in turn whether you realize it or not are going to turn into bigger things and they're just going to prepare you for life in the long run um and you know especially i mean hey if you are a stud at basketball and and you know you're getting all these scholarships like don't have don't slack in the classroom <laughs> either <laughs> you know don't half ass it in the classrooms like for example um stanford was one of the schools that i was considering um but i technically didn't get a scholarship because until they know that you can get um accepted into their school they're not going to offer you a scholarship so by working you know making sure that you keep your grades up you're just keeping all doors open so um, you know, just, just win both and just be the best that you can. And, and, you know, but at the same time, you're going to have bad days. I see so many kids that just put so much pressure on themselves and they come to practice and they just break down, but it's like, you're allow yourself to have bad days and like time off at the same time. So just, it's all going to be okay. As long as you know that you're working as hard as you can, let that be enough. And, you know, shoot for the stars. I mean, I know that sounds so cliche maybe, but really like set the bar high and don't settle for anything less. I love it. That's a great way to close it out. Um, how, what was your GPA in high school? 
Uh, I had around a 4.0. Nice. So I, How many and I had my IP classes. Um, points. So I think the highest I ever averaged was 29 in my sophomore year. And then it was kind of nice because my junior and senior year, other girls stepped up. So my averages actually went down because we had more girls to score. So it was great. Best accomplishment that you have had, basketball, academics, or otherwise? Oh boy, that's a heavy question. <laughs> Best accomplishment? Award, accomplishment, something notable? Um, honestly, I think just graduating from USC. Um, I mean, the amount of work that had to be put in, like I was talking to you guys about the practice schedule and then maintaining, you know, pretty, like, I think I had a 3.5 at USC, um, when I graduated. And so just coming out, graduated, I had an internship lined up with the PAC 12 network and then a couple of offers overseas to play, um, professional basketball. So like I was talking about, I worked my butt off both in the classroom and on the court and it set myself up for after I graduated and gave me options. So, um, you know, I'd say I'm, I'm pretty proud of myself for those two things. <laughs> Absolutely, as you should be. And um, no, let that be a lesson to everybody because having that Pac-12 um, network internship, it was an internship, correct? Yeah, it was an and internship uh, up in San Francisco. So um, I moved up there for a summer and yeah, if I didn't go play professionally overseas, I, I would have uh, had a job, but you know, have to go for the adventure sometimes. <laughs> But now that is translated after a couple years of professional basketball in Europe to being the head coach of one of the more notable club basketball teams in California and probably the country without naming names. <laughs> uh, and not only that, working for a company that is in the athletic industry, which is something you're passionate about. So congratulations uh, on all of that. And thank you so much for your advice to our uh, young men and young ladies here. Thank you. I appreciate that. And um, just thank you for having me on. I mean, it's so great to, to talk to kids. And I know they have so much going on these days. So, you know, any advice that I can offer to maybe help get them through it. But, um, you know, kids are resilient. You guys are going to be fine. Just, yeah, like I said, just focus on the day, win the day. And pretty soon this is going to be over and you're going to be better for it. So hang in there. <laughs>